Avatar Market in Mogadishu. NATO's military success against many Western nations. This is on assignment. Hello again and welcome to On Assignment, your source for the stories behind the stories. And I'm Imran Siddiqui. And I'm Alex Villarreal. Coming up, what the U.S.-Cuba thaw could mean for the nation's economy. In Iraq, ancient treasures destroyed. The attacks by militants reverberate around the world. Making the smartphone even smarter, we show you a new technology that could allow your phone to diagnose disease. And trash in the Pacific Ocean? Why the problem is even worse than it appears. Join us as we dive straight in on Assignment Starts right now. We've been talking a lot lately on our show about the opening of U.S.-Cuba ties. On the table, lifting a half-century trade embargo and easing banking and travel restrictions, the negotiations come despite some serious concerns in Congress and in the Cuban-American community. But U.S. farmers have been generally supportive of the prospect of opening Cuba to greater trade. I talked about the economic potential of the thaw with VOA's Miller Sega. Check it out. Welcome to Cuba, where little has changed since 1961 when the U.S. severed diplomatic ties. But that may be changing. All right, Mill, talking about this opening up of relations between the U.S. and Cuba, who stands to benefit the most? I think it's a win-win situation uh, for both countries. Now, a lot of people will say, yeah, but Cuba is a very, very small market. It's like number 66 GDP around the world, right? And the U.S. is number one. So what does the U.S. have to gain? Well, uh, Cuba is, is very close to the United States. It's a very nearby market, right? And you're talking about a, a, a great potential there. When you talk about the Cuban market, what are going to be the products that the U.S. will want to push out? Number one, probably uh, uh, tobacco, for one thing, from Cuba. But I think, see, here's what's interesting. There's a lot in it for the United States because uh, Cuba has a hard time growing enough cattle uh, uh, to, to eat meat. So they will rely on the United States uh, for, for a lot of beef uh, imports to, to this country. Uh, they will also need a lot of financial services uh, simply because they're just not geared for it right now. They're not, dealing, they're not doing a lot of trade around the world, especially not with the biggest economy in the world. So I think what you'll see is, is, is a, a, a nice give and take. There's a lot of agricultural products in, in Cuba that we also need to mention, sugar being one of them, sugar and tobacco. Missouri Senator Claire McCaskill, a Democrat, was with a group of U.S. lawmakers who went to Cuba on a mission to look at trade opportunities for American companies. And I come from a very big agricultural state. We would love to sell the Cuban people more rice. We would love to sell them more chicken and more beans and more corn. So hopefully um, this trip will also help my farmers at home. But any outreach to Cuba faces strong opposition from critics in the Republican-controlled Congress, who say Cuba's smaller economy stands to benefit more. It may be small, but it's a market many American companies want access to. And you, you talked about how there already are a lot of food products that Cuba is getting from the U.S. Right. Uh, in fact, 30 percent of Cuba's uh, food imports already come from the United States. And the only reason that is is because in 2000, uh, the embargo on foodstuffs was lifted by the United States. But there were a lot of conditions uh, associated with that, including you need to pay us in cash. Now, getting back to the cigars, because that's such a, a, a popular item when you think about You think things cigars, that you think Havana, you. right? Exactly. Industry experts say Cuban cigars could take over as much as a third of the premium cigar market in the U.S. if trade restrictions were lifted. David Savona is executive editor at Cigar Aficionado magazine. Cuba is the birthplace of cigars. When you, when you think about Cuba, you can't help but think about cigars. All right, so a, a big concern for people who aren't so sure about this opening up of relations is that the money that Cuba is going to gain from increased trade is going to go straight into the hands of the Castros. What's been the talk about that? Well, I don't know. I mean, that argument is, is made a lot. But if you just think about the remittances that Cubans receive from the United States, you're talking about $2 billion a year. So U.S. money is already entering the country. There's no question about that. Uh, there's the other argument uh, that I'm hearing from, from some uh, economists from the IMF that suggests that, look, it may be a small market, but if you open this up, you may actually be in for some political change as well because there is an appetite for reform. The vast majority of Americans support lifting the trade embargo, some 68%. And if you, even if you look at the Cubans who, who 
uh, have been hurt a lot by, by U.S. economic policies. Uh, they have very positive attitudes about the United States. The only holdouts would be a few members in, in, in Congress who, uh, who support older generation Cuban Americans, primarily in Florida, who still have a lot of ill feelings towards the Castro regime. And that's really the biggest holdup there. Otherwise, from an economic standpoint, from, a, from an emotional standpoint, from a nationalistic standpoint, it all makes sense, I think, for both sides. Well, half a world away from Cuba, the city of Mosul, north of Baghdad, was once one of Iraq's most culturally rich and religiously diverse cities. Now it is the territory of Islamic State militants after they took control of the city last June, and they haven't stopped there. The group has been destroying ancient sites and artifacts in the name of religion. The Mosul Museum has been one such target. As VOA's Kane Farabaugh tells on assignments, Philip Alexio, and the destruction has archaeologists around the world very concerned. It took only minutes for members of Islamic State to permanently damage priceless Iraqi treasures that had survived thousands of years of turmoil. The images released in February show militants drilling and hammering artifacts in the Mosul Museum, shocking people around the world. Kane, what are the historians and the archaeologists saying about the destruction that's going on in Mosul? Well, first off, they're appalled. I mean, these are folks, uh, particularly the ones that I've talked to at the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago, these are folks that have actually been in country. These are folks who have studied some of those ar artifacts that are in the video, that are in Mosul. It's very, very hard to, to, to keep from going into a depression over this. I mean, this is, this is an incredible loss of, of everything we, we work for. He was also indicating uh, there's been news that some of these are replicas or, or imitations. He said that indeed might be the case, but in the video he believes he's seeing some genuine artifacts being permanently destroyed. One is a statue of a winged bull with a human head over 2,500 years old. They actually took the face off one of the surviving bulls, which is actually in very, very good shape. And then they took apart two other bulls that were in very, very bad shape. The winged bull was excavated in Iraq in the 1920s and 1930s by archaeologists of the Oriental Institute. A similar, larger statue discovered during that time is one of the largest pieces now on display at the Institute's museum. So why are they doing it? Why is the Islamic State trying to just destroy everything that they can find, at least here in Mosul? And I'm sure they're trying to do this in some of the other cities, or probably planning to anyway. I think that's a difficult question for anyone to answer. Uh, there could be several facets to this. One is that uh, these artifacts, these, these images, these figures, many of these historic items predate the Islamic faith itself, and, and some of the faith may consider these things to be idolatrous, and there is some kind of impetus to destroy or deface them, prescribing to certain uh, religious beliefs. H however, there, there may be an internal and an external audience for uh, this kind of destruction. The internal audience uh, would be obviously the people living in areas controlled by the Islamic State uh, to show what they can do, to sort of uh, flex muscle perhaps. The external audience could be uh, the rest of the world, showing them that this is a means by which they can control their territory, they can control things uh, where they have access to these kind of artifacts and historic sites. So what would be the lasting effect other than obviously the physical destruction of these artifacts? We all come from somewhere and there is this uh, need in some of us to understand where we're from and what our shared human history is. And so uh, Iraq itself is uh, home to ancient Mesopotamia, which is the cradle of civilization. It is the place where civilization uh, at least in our recorded history, begins. It's the place where we can see how cities form. And so these items, these artifacts, these places in this part of the world are important to everyone around the world to help us understand that shared human history. And what about Laura Tedesco over at the State Department uh, Cultural Heritage Program? Uh, what did she say about what was going on? It's a form of cultural genocide by completely cutting off a civilization from its heritage, from its cultural past. It's a way to um, eradicate a sense of identity. It actually affects the, the ability for this country to sort of uh, help itself by bringing people into the country to see these important historic places and items. Um, this is true in Afghanistan. This is the site of the ancient uh, Bamiyan Buddhist statues. They were built in the 6th century BC. 
and they survived all of this time. Well, in 2001, when the Taliban controlled this part of Afghanistan, um, they detonated and destroyed these large Buddhist statues. And so these are structures which, you know, they were renowned around the world. People came from all over the world to see these giant statues. They were destroyed. There's nothing to see there now in Afghanistan except for the empty hole of where these massive uh, Buddhist statues once existed. Some difficult video to watch, and it's still happening. Islamic State recently destroyed parts of two ancient Iraqi cities not far from Mosul using bulldozers. The United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization has called this deliberate destruction of cultural heritage a war crime. We're taking a break now, but when we come back, how smartphones are being turned into HIV tests. You're watching on Assignment. Diagnosing HIV and other infections usually requires costly clinical tests, making it a problem for poor patients and those in remote areas. But a new technology may make the tests as accessible as your phone. Scientists at New York's Columbia University have developed a chip that turns a smartphone into a diagnostic tool. And joining me right now is George Putish, VOA science reporter, to talk about this. Wow, isn't this amazing? A technology like that will help millions of people. Tell us a little bit about that, please. Smartphones are now small computers, actually. And uh, uh, also the technology of lab on a chip has developed very much. So. The scientists at Columbia University joined the two, created a little device that connects to the smartphone. Uh, you take a blood sample, and in 15 minutes, it shows you whether uh, the person has HIV or, uh, or, or other infections. So you said 15 minutes. That's the turnaround time, minutes, yes. right? But what about the accuracy? Accuracy is pretty good. Uh, so far, they've done a test on a rather small sample of uh, 96 people in Rwanda, but the accuracy was between 76 and 100 percent for, for uh, different uh, results. So this is pretty high, you know, for a device that costs only 34 dollars against the lab device that costs over $18,000. Wow, and the time that it's going to take. But is it easy to uh, train people on how to use this device? It's very easy. It takes about 30 minutes. It's not a device that uh, uh, ordinary you know, citizens should go and buy and, and check for themselves. But it takes only about 30 minutes, and it uh, re does not require any other special equipment. And what's also very important, it does not drain the battery of the smartphone it's connected to. Okay, and you mentioned that they tested it on about 95 96. 96 patients, but it's not actually being used in remote areas, or is it? No, it has not. Uh, the scientists say they want uh, still need tests and, and adjusting the uh, device so that uh, they can raise the accuracy to as much as possible. And George, besides detecting uh, HIV from a blood sample, this device can also do other things? This particular device uh, can also test for syphilis. But labs on chips are devices that can do all kinds of, uh, of uh, chemical testing of, of, uh, of uh, liquids. So yes, there are uh, devices that are being developed for other infectious diseases, such as malaria, for instance. So I expect that very soon we will see similar devices for all kinds of other Diseases. Okay, and we're looking forward to more. Thank you so much, George Putish, VOA science correspondent. You're always welcome. Thank you. We're taking a break now. When we come back, we hear about all that plastic that's in the Pacific Ocean and causing all sorts of problems. You're watching on assignment. Out in the North Pacific Ocean, there is this humongous garbage patch that's been trapping debris from both hemispheres. And this trash, much of it being plastic, it's just a terrible eyesore and it's even threatening sea life. Yeah, and it might be the size of Texas. Which is crazy. I mean, it's in, huge. in Honolulu, researchers are tracking the so-called Great Pacific Plastic Patch. Viewers Michael Sullivan was in Hawaii for the inside scoop. Here's what he told me about what he learned. 
We've been hearing about this trash patch for 15 or 20 years, and uh, what most people imagine is a, you know, like uh, islands of trash. And, and there is trash to be seen out there. Sometimes it accumulates because we have this circular, what they call a gyre, which is a circular current, and it's, it tends to get trapped in the center. As you get closer and closer to the center of that, the, the central axis of that feature, the waters become more quiescent. So they tend to trap floating debris. The Pacific Trash Patch is famously as big as the U.S. state of Texas, but Carl says what is seen from passing ships is mostly empty ocean. He says the churning of the ocean quickly reduces much of the plastic to a chemical sludge. The biggest danger comes from the trash that you cannot see. It gets uh, beaten down into microscopic uh, particles or very small particles that are consumed by things like plankton. Then the jellyfish eat the plankton and the larger predators eat the jellyfish and it is affecting the entire food chain and some of it again comes back to humans as we catch some of those fish. Experts also say that this is a part of the natural cycle and it will eventually kind of take care of itself. How, how much truth is there to this? Well, you know, the, the plastic is going to stay there in one form or other for hundreds of years. Uh, this is the problem. Whether we see it or not, uh, it'll eventually, you know, in geological uh, time, it's uh, you know, a few hundred years is nothing, but in human time, that's a long, uh, you know, a long duration to have it as, as, a, as a contaminant. And the problem is we're not uh, reducing the use of plastic and more and more of this is going into the uh, waterways and into the ocean and ending up in this North Pacific uh, gyre. Most trash in the ocean is mostly invisible since some is in fluid form and some sinks to the bottom and cannot be seen. So when we're talking about this contemporary uh, Great Pacific plastic patch, as it has been called, we're only skimming the surface, literally. Some cities, you know, LA is reducing the use of plastic bags, and you're seeing that in other parts of the world as well. But unless we do something more dramatic, we're going to have more plastic in the ocean, and it'll be more of an environmental problem. So what is it that they're planning to do to avoid this? Well, again, cities like Los Angeles have banned the use of uh, uh, plastic bags. Uh, around California, we're seeing, uh, and in Hawaii, we're seeing a lot of uh, cities that are, are uh, saying, if you want to use a plastic bag, you have to pay for it. So the effect is to reduce the uh, use of plastic bags and to get, to, people, to get people to bring in their own reusable uh, bags. But the bigger problem as well is uh, plastic packaging uh, and uh, you throw away one-time use plastic and uh, we really have to do something about that, and, and nobody is doing much right now. When they know that the uh, plastic is causing such a lot of damage, why don't they just ban plastics? You know, it was uh, touted in the 1950s when we suddenly had this plastic revolution as, as a miracle uh, substance, and it, it's cheap. You can manufacture things with it. You can make cameras out of it. We can make automobile bumpers out of it, uh, but uh, and we can make packaging, but we have never really, uh, as a society, tackled the, uh, the environmental uh, impacts of plastic. And that's what, uh, you know, we're starting to do on a small scale, but we have to do it on a much a larger scale, according to these scientists. Okay, the reason why I ask you this, because, I mean, in the 1930s, things were being packaged with hemp products, which are recyclable and biodegradable. I don't know why people don't think about going back to that. You know, I think we may eventually do this. When I go to the supermarket here, and I've seen this in Hawaii, you see a lot of people bringing in cloth bags, reusable cloth bags. And we may, you know, it's, it's an older style of shopping. It's, it's something that, um, that, that works well, and we may eventually all be going back to that. Thanks to Michael Sullivan for this. And Alex, we should mention here that DC also had a five cent plastic bag tax that was imposed on shoppers a couple of years back. Right, and this was something that locals here were not so keen on, having to spend a little bit more money for their stuff, but it's been a good thing because the move has already greatly reduced the bags that end up in our waters here. So, good move. All right, well, speaking of water life, our next story covers the practice of boat building, which goes back thousands of years. Our Rebecca Ward visited the Aleutian Islands in the U.S. Upper Northwest, where boats have long been an important part of life. And to pursue their prey, ancient Aleuts used a small, quick kayak that the Russians later called a badurka. 
The boats are unique to the region and are still made today. Take a look. A lot of indigenous boats from Africa are, most of them are dugouts where they start with a big log and remove everything that doesn't look like a boat. And we take the little splinters and tie them all together and make it look like a boat. Corey Friedman is teaching a handful of students at the Center for Wooden Boats in Seattle how to build a badarka, a kayak type craft indigenous to the Aleutian Islands. What makes it real conducive to our uh, culture today is uh, the lack of materials. We use very, very little materials, thus our boats are the lightest in the world. In class, the boats are made pretty much the same way they would have been made hundreds of years ago, with the help of some power tools and without the skin of an animal. As you can see, we don't use any jigs or forms or molds or, or uh, any type of assistance like that. They're all done, built like sculptures, freehand. Uh, so it's more of an art than a science. The boats are also built without the help of a plan or drawing. And despite the students' woodworking knowledge, the project is a challenging one. The entire structure, there's no glue, there's no screws, there's no nails. This is all, we, we, use, we use bamboo, but any kind of little doweling to, to peg the parts together. And then, and then as you can see up here, uh, it's all lashing. You know, the, you know the, the, the native lashing, of course, would have been sinew or uh, uh, cedar fiber, that kind of thing. We use, a, a, it's a wax impregnated nylon cord. Traditionally, he says the Aleuts used the Vidarka as a hunting boat. The, the Aleuts would, would chase down uh, seals and sea lions uh, in this boat, so it's a very, very fast boat. Uh, I, I've heard that there's evidence that the, 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 when, the, when the Russians showed up in the area, they found the, the natives paddling along at six, seven, eight, ten knots chasing, chasing seals. Building a sleek little boat like this takes about nine days in Friedman's class. And although the boats look pretty much the same, Friedman says each one is unique to the person and personality of the builder. Not just their anatomy, but we actually uh, match the dragon friction to their horsepower, and the boats are shaped actually to their personality. Uh, sounds hokey, but if one person's more competitive than another, we're gonna have different shape boats. All, the, all those things are taken advantage of. The students here at Seattle Center for Wooden Boats are all adults, but Friedman says he also teaches the art of boat building to a much younger group of students in Alaska. With a government grant uh, where they pluck uh, indigenous youth, the teenagers uh, 12 to 14, from villages all over the state. It's a leadership program, and the boat building that we do is uh, one facet of what they learn there. And at the end of camp for about 10 days to two weeks, they actually uh, go on an expedition using the boats that they built. Friedman says he's had a passion for boat building Stroke. since childhood. And when it comes to sharing that passion with kids from the region where the boat was first made. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. And that's your story. <laughs> Rebecca Ward, VOA News. It is pretty awesome, isn't it? But what is not so awesome right now is that it's time for us to close out the show. That is so sad. But but you know what? You guys, you don't have to miss too much because you can just log on to VOAnews.com and see all our programs and segments anytime, anywhere. Yeah, and we're also on YouTube and Facebook, and we would love to hear from you guys about what you want to see on the program. So until we join you again, our entire team here at On Assignment wishes you a fantastic week. Goodbye.